Welcome. Uh, my name is Hunter Jeffers, and I'm an attorney that uh, represents SEBA. And I'm excited today because we finally get to announce the new revised purchase and sale agreement forms. Uh, it's been a long process. It's been in the works. Uh, it's relied on input from the brokerage community, from the legal community. Uh, and we finally have some new and updated forms to roll out for you. Uh, it's been approximately 10 years since the whole suite itself has been uh, reviewed like this and updated. Uh, nonetheless, our goal is, is not to throw too many changes at you. You'll see that most of the purchase and sale agreement addenda uh, remain for the most part the same, uh, but we focus on uh, quite a few changes to the main purchase and sale agreement real estate form in order to make it more user friendly in order to update it to uh, the current market conditions uh, and just generally to improve the quality of the form. So I'm excited to share those changes with you. And of course, if you ever have any questions about how to use the form, uh, SEBA is always available to help, uh, and so am I. All right, let's get started. Um, we'll focus first, I think, on the purchase and sale agreement form, uh, the real estate form that is. Uh, you'll notice right away uh, that it appears very different than it did before. And that is simply because we wanted to make it more easy to use more easy to understand. Uh, so if you have the new agreement in front of you, if you look at the first page, right away you'll notice that we've brought all the information that needs to be inserted into the document right to the first page. Um, so what we're trying to avoid here uh, is having to comb through the form and find every little blank that must be filled in in order for the agreement to be enforceable. Instead, now all of those blanks are on the first page uh, and we'll walk through them one by one uh, here in a minute. There are still some timelines to enter later on in the agreement, um, but we've inserted default time periods for those. So in case any of them are missed um, or you don't feel like they need to be changed, uh, that will not affect the enforceability of the agreement. Okay, let's take a look at the first page. Um, much of this information should look familiar to you. Uh, things like the property and the names of the parties and things like that were always right up front on the purchase and sale agreement. The format just probably looks a little bit different. Now, what I'll do is I'll kind of work through some of the individual lines and highlight uh, new opportunities for information or new things for you to notice and some changes we made. Uh, that way, when you're going through the agreement yourself, you're kind of familiar with what that is and why it's there. First, you'll see uh, in line two and three, we have buyer and seller. So we wanted to provide more space to insert company names, to insert multiple parties, uh, and that's why we've created a little more space for you to do that. We've also allowed and provided for you to insert what type of entity the buyer or seller is, or if it's an individual. So you'll see that right below buyer and seller, it says A or AN, and that means a Washington li limited liability company, an individual, um, a couple, a married couple, things like that. And so that way for title, title knows exactly uh, what the parties are, uh, where the entities form, things that you would typically see on a legally drafted purchase and sale agreement. Moving down to purchase price, this is something we pulled up from the body of the document. So now not only is the purchase price right there, but also you see how it's payable. Um, and you will check cash, you'll check financing, and that references the SEBA financing addendum. Uh, and then we also inserted other, just to give, again, our goal is to make these forms as flexible and usable as possible. Uh, and that way, we've, we're giving you as many options as we feel like is appropriate. Uh, similarly with earnest money, so this is section five. You'll see we're moving right along on some of these basic terms in a lease. Um, there is now the option to transfer earnest money by wire or electronic transfer. That's something that uh, maybe above all other requests we received from the brokerage community that we include that option uh, addition to, in addition to check uh, or a promissory note. In that same section, um, you select who should hold the earnest money, whether that's the selling firm uh, or the closing agent. Again, what we're trying to do is bring all these material terms together on the first page uh, so that once you complete that first page, this becomes a working document for you through the transaction and for title and escrow. Right away, they can see who's holding the earnest money and how it's being transferred. Moving to the next section, section six, uh, we have what feels maybe like a new term, and that's the feasibility contingency date. So in the old agreement, we had the feasibility period, which was a specified period of time. 
Uh, some of the feedback we received is a little more certainty on when the feasibility contingency expires. So we've changed that term to now say, here is a date, the feasibility contingency date. After that date, feasibility has waived uh, or been satisfied, and there's complete clarity to the parties. There's no math involved. You'll notice that we did include an alternative there if the parties don't insert a date. We want to make sure the agreement's still enforceable, and this is a material term. So we did say, if there is nothing inserted, it's 30 days after mutual acceptance. So you're not completely free from math if you don't fill in a precise date. But our hope here is that the parties have that option. So continuing to move down the form, um, we're at section eight. You see closing agent. That should be pretty straightforward. We see section nine. That's title insurance company. Again, all these major players we want listed on that first page. OK, section 10 is new. Uh, so here's one of the main substantive changes that I get to tell you about. Um, the brokerage community really requested some flexibility on the form of a deed that's used to transfer a property. Uh, so before, it was only a statutory warranty deed that was included in the agreement. And of course, the parties could change that if they wanted something else. But now, we are including the option to transfer title by a bargain and sale deed. Um, which is legally a little bit different than a statutory warranty deed. There are less warranties involved. Um, but this was, again, a response to the brokerage community to insert some flexibility, again, where they would like it in terms of the deed. Sections 12, 13, 14, 15, these should all be familiar to you. Um, they were just buried deeper in the agreement uh, before, but now we're bringing them to the front so everyone knows what's going on. It's important to check one of these boxes every time. Um, there have been cases, even some recently, where brokers forget to check a box on remedies, and then something happens in the transaction, and what do we do? We don't know what the remedies are. Uh, so make sure to take your time and look at all the options and check box by box. You'll see that, too, with the agency disclosure at Section 16. Important for each broker to check which client they represent. Uh, hopefully that one isn't as confusing as some of the other terms. Uh, and then the final section on this first page is exhibits and addenda. So again, we wanted to pull the list of exhibits and addenda right up to the front. And now you can kind of go through them and look at each one and decide uh, which ones apply to this transaction. We also included two boxes for other. Uh, we know that sometimes clients have their own attorneys, have their own addenda. Uh, sometimes big institutional clients already have their addenda drafted. So now you can write those in check the box and add them to the agreement. And it's very clear when someone picks up that first page, okay, here are all the addenda that are a part of this agreement. Okay, so now we've walked through that first page and there's a lot of information I realize on the first page. And I think what's important and what should make you feel comfortable is that those are all the big business terms. Those are what you see in your letters of intent. Um, those are what the parties maybe were emailing about. And so by walking through them systematically, it, it's a checkpoint for you to make sure that you've covered all sort of the main deal points and you're not drafting up this agreement and on page 25 realizing, shoot, I didn't cover this or we didn't talk about this. This can be kind of a work in LOI for you. Um, and so once we get past this first page, our goal is that the rest of the document can kind of stand for itself. Of course, if the parties want to make edits to certain parts, uh, they can do that. But now we've put in a lot of that big substantive information already into the agreement, and it's immediately available for you when you need to come back to the document. It's right there, right on page one. Uh, so we feel good about that. We think that's going to provide a lot of benefit to the community and just make transactions clearer and easier to, uh, to complete. Which brings us to page two. Um, so page two should look similar. The only difference is instead of it being the last page of the agreement, now it's the second page. And we did that because it's the contact information for everyone involved. And personally, I remember flipping through page after page after page, trying to find where, where is the end of this document so that I know who to call or I need a phone number. And now you don't have to do that. Now it's right there on page two. Uh, and we gave it its, its own page because there are a lot of parties involved, usually in commercial transactions. So you'll see the buyer and seller right away. That's straightforward. Moving down, we have the selling firm identified and the listing firm. We've updated this a little bit. So um, we have email addresses included now as opposed uh, to just fax. We have a selling broker's DOL license number included as well. That's important for compliance reasons and it's something we were seeing that would add value to this form. 
Uh, and then we've also have the firm license number included as well. And then right below that, we brought up the section that uh, allows you to put in attorneys or uh, any sort of third party that should also receive notices under the agreement. Um, as with the old agreement, this page is really important because when a notice needs to be delivered under this uh, agreement, this is where the notice goes. So it's important to have it completely filled out. Um, the emails, the phone numbers, uh, the addresses, everything that's in there is important because that's, again, how you deliver notice under the transaction. Okay, so turn to page three now of the new form. Um, I'm not going to go line by line through every provision in this agreement. Most of, of the substance from here on out is actually the same as it was before. Uh, so I'm going to focus on a few areas that we changed or where we added new language, uh, and I'll point that out to you. It might still look a little different because you'll remember that we pulled out some of the terms and put it onto page one. Um, so if, you're, if the things look like they're missing, uh, that might be why. Otherwise, I'll, I'll hopefully touch on them here today. Uh, so let's, let's go first to section 22, uh, where we talk about title insurance. Uh, here, instead of uh, giving the parties the option to select standard or extended coverage title insurance, we just include a default that it's standard coverage and state that if a buyer wants extended coverage, they have to pay for it. Uh, this is a standard term that we see in a lot of the agreements I draft and our office drafts. Uh, so we felt like that was a little bit clear, and it's one less step for you as a broker uh, one less box for you to check it. Okay, section 22B. So we're still under title insurance, and now what we're looking at is permitted exceptions. And I wanted to point this out because we did make some changes to how the uh, title review process goes and the deadlines uh, that, are, that come up within that, but it shouldn't be complicated. And I think it's easiest if we just kind of read through sentence by sentence, and that way it's completely clear how this new process goes. So this should look familiar, sentence one, buyer shall notify seller of any objectionable matters in the title report or any supplemental report within the earlier of 20 days, if not completed, after receipt of the preliminary commitment for title insurance or the feasibility contingency date. So this is similar to how it was before. Uh, so no alarm should be going off yet. Uh, the idea here is that the seller gets, gets the either 20 days or up to the feasibility contingency date to object to something they don't like on the title report. Where we start to see changes is after that. Uh, so next, it says that the agreement automatically terminates unless the buyer gives notice uh, that they are waiving their objections or waiving the feasibility contingency in that context. So you'll remember CBA forms are always uh, err on the side of failing as opposed to err on the side of continuing. Um, that's a difference between SEBA and Northwest MLS forms. Uh, with Northwest MLS forms, you have to affirmatively terminate an agreement. Uh, but here, still, the agreement will terminate unless the buyer gives notice. So here it says the agreement will terminate and buyer receives a refund of their earnest money uh, unless within five days of buyer's objections, seller delivers notice of its intent to remove uh, all objectionable provisions. So again, this should feel pretty comfortable. This should feel pretty normal. We have 20 days for the buyer to deliver objections and then five days for the seller to respond to them. The next sentence is different. If seller fails to give timely notice that it will clear all disapproved objections, this agreement shall automatically terminate. That's that fail safe. And buyer shall receive a refund of the earnest money unless buyer notifies seller within three days that the buyer waives any objections that seller does not agree to remove. So what does that mean? So that means that it isn't necessarily the end of the transaction if the seller does not deliver notice that, they will, that the seller will clear the transactions. It means that the buyer then gets the opportunity to decide, okay, do I want to terminate this deal over these title objections? Uh, we want that decision to be in the buyer's hands because it's the buyer who first objected. And so now the buyer basically has three days to reconsider, to withdraw those objections. And if the buyer doesn't, then that agreement will automatically terminate uh, three days after the seller fails to clear the objection. Hopefully that makes sense. It's a little bit different, but we think that by providing some detail there, it helps the parties actually walk through the process before uh, after the initial objections, it was kind of just up to the parties to figure it out within a specified time period. 
Now we're shifting responsibilities back and forth from the buyer to the seller, back to the buyer. And at all times, the fail safe means that the agreement will terminate if a party doesn't clear the objections. Uh, so for a, again, for a buyer's sake, there's a fail safe. Okay, looking at 23A now. So this is the first subsection underneath the feasibility contingency. It still addresses books and records, so that should look familiar. It says at the beginning, seller shall deliver to buyer or post in an online database. So we received tons of comments about this. I think mostly because this form in that area hadn't been updated in over 10 years, and since then, technology has changed. Uh, parties are transferring documents completely differently than they were before. Uh, so now we brought this form into the 21st century, and that is expressly allowed. The rest of this subsection should look pretty familiar. Uh, we kept, I think, all of the language the same, talking about what must be delivered, um, and, and that is in terms of the true correct copies, but then also listing out examples of things for your clients to remember. Uh, so if you're ever in doubt, just show them this paragraph, and that way they can see, it might jog their memory, they can see things like property management agreements, uh, consultant agreements, leases, things like that. It could be a helpful tool, and so we wanted to keep that in there. Okay, so at the end of 23A, we see some new language. Any information provided or to be provided by seller with respect to the property is solely for buyer's convenience and seller has not made an independent investigation or verification of such information and makes no representations. So again, our goal here with this provision is the seller should be turning everything over and then it becomes the buyer's responsibility to review it and take a look. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean the seller is making warranties or representations about that information. We actually address reps and warranties later. Uh, so we wanted to make that really clear in the body of the document. The next subsection is 23B. So this still, still deals with access uh, as before. And, and most of this subsection is the same in terms of the access that's allowed for the buyer entering the property. We added one requirement that's new, and it has to do with insurance. Uh, so now we are requiring buyers uh, before entering the property to have commercial general liability insurance in an amount of no less than $2 million. And then the buyer must deliver to seller prior to entry certificates of that insurance. Uh, so while this may feel new and unexpected perhaps, the point here is that we want insurance to take care of anything that might go wrong when the buyer visits the property. That gives seller peace of mind when the buyer's there or the buyer's representatives are conducting due diligence, are doing testing, um, and maybe altering the property. Now the seller can relax because the seller knows that the buyer has insurance to cover things that might go wrong. And similarly, the buyer's protected now. If something happens while they're at the property that was unexpected, uh, we want to make sure the buyer's protected. Okay, then we can actually skip ahead quite a bit. So um, these sections on pages six and seven should all largely be the same as they were before. Of course, if you have questions, don't hesitate to call SEBA. Um, but much of this language is exactly the same, nearly identical. Um, I want to call one thing out, and that's in section 29. Uh, this is on page seven. This deals with post-closing adjustments, collections, payments, things like that. We added a time period uh, which says that post-closing adjustments must be made within 180 days. Uh, so before we felt like it was a little open-ended. Um, if sometimes when a transaction is done, adjustments need to be made afterwards uh, to change the financial responsibility of the parties. And we want to make sure that gets done within at least a reasonable amount of time. So we added 180 days. That should give you plenty of time to do it. It shouldn't hamstring you in that way, uh, but it prevents one party from dragging it on uh, or making a claim a year and a half later uh, for a post-closing adjustment, which would be really unfair to whatever party's receiving it. Okay, we can fast forward now to section 32, and, and these are sellers' representations and warranties. Uh, there are one, two, three, four, I think, new representations that the seller's making. So it's really important that we touch, touch on those, but I think they'll make a lot of sense to you uh, and to your clients if you're the listing agent. So subsection B added some language that says the seller is representing that the books and records are true, accurate, and complete, and here's the key language, to the best of seller's knowledge. Uh, so if the seller isn't making a blanket statement that everything they give is true and correct, 
They're just saying that to the best of my knowledge, it is. Uh, and so that sort of apportions the risk in a way that we feel is fair between the parties. Subsections J through L have some additional representations and warranties uh, that weren't in there before. And so I'll just walk through those one by one. So first, seller has not granted any options or obligated itself in any manner whatsoever to sell the property. Hopefully that makes good common sense. Uh, the buyer doesn't want the seller signing a purchase and sale agreement if the seller's already agreed to sell it to a tenant. Uh, so that's why that's there. And then we have subsection K, the very next one. It says that neither seller nor any of its partners, members, or shareholders, et cetera, are restricted from doing business under the regulations of the Office of Foreign Asset Control of the Department of the Treasury. So this is a good example of something that will only be a problem if you already know it's a problem or your client. Uh, so we are not putting an additional obligation on you to necessarily check with the uh, Department of the Treasury for every transaction you have. Uh, but this is important and this is a new legislative update that we want to make sure that we are disclosing or not disclosing, or perhaps more accurately, that the buyer knows that the seller is not, uh, is not restricted by the Office of Foreign Asset Control. And the final new representation is very straightforward. You see this in most PSAs. It says that the individual who's signing the agreement on behalf of the seller represents and warrants the buyer that he or she has the authority to act on behalf of and bind the seller. So what we don't want to have happen is for an individual to sign the agreement who didn't have authority, and now the seller says, we didn't agree to any representations and warranties, we didn't agree to this PSA, and uh, a buyer in that case would be left looking at the individual who signed it and going, well, what about this individual? This individual said that they have authority to do all these things. And so now we're making sure that the individual uh, himself, herself, has the authority to uh, sign this agreement, and the buyer has a remedy if that's not true. So those aren't all the changes we made to Section 32. There's actually one more change that we should pay attention to. Uh, it's in the final paragraph, and that paragraph addresses what happens when a seller or buyer, uh, it turns out, makes false representations. And sometimes this can be discovered during due diligence. One party gets some information, and we realize, oh, one of those representations was false. Uh, so in the old agreement, there was a limit, and it said that if the damages resulting from a breach of a representation or warranty exceeded a given amount, then it was in a way considered material and would allow the other party to terminate the agreement. Here we're a little bit more flexible. Uh, so it now says that if uh, information is discovered that would cause any of the representations to be false as of that date, then the party discovering the information first must notify the other party. So that's the same. That should feel comfortable. And then as its sole remedy, may elect to terminate the agreement. What we're doing is we're treating this essentially as a breach of a representation um, or a breach of a warranty. And we think that could impact uh, the agreement in a variety of ways and therefore giving the buyer the opportunity, oh, I guess, or the seller, whatever the discovering party is, to terminate the agreement at that time because one of the representations on which that party relied in making this agreement is false. Uh, and that felt material to us in itself. And so we adjusted that to just simply say, if it's discovered that a representation or warranty was false, um, the discovering party now has the option to terminate the agreement. Okay, you can skip ahead two sections now to 34, but we're on the same topic. So this is buyer's representations. Uh, whereas 32, we were addressing seller's representation. In the old agreement, buyer didn't make any representations. And that's not uncommon, but we wanted to add some basic ones here that I think as I describe them, they'll make sense to you. So the first representation is that the transaction does not conflict with or result in a breach of any law or regulation or injunction, a thing like that. In other words, we want the buyer to say that it's not illegal to enter into this contract with the seller. Subsection B says that entering into it also does not constitute a breach of another agreement the buyer has entered into. And those are the two. So two very basic representations that the buyer, in essence, is legally and contractually allowed to enter into this agreement with the seller. Uh, finally, we have a similar representation for individuals. So once again, the individual signing on behalf of the buyer is representing 
that that individual has authority to sign the agreement. So the next section, section 35, should look new as well. So this deals with claims, and specifically claims relating to a breach of the representations and warranties in the agreement. Legally, once a transaction closes, things like representations and warranties uh, usually are over and done with, at least the ones that were in the purchase and sale agreement. What this section says and clarifies is that those representations and warranties survive the closing of the transaction for nine months. Uh, in other words, if something's discovered that's false or was a breach of those, um, they're considered to extend even after the transaction is closed, but no longer than nine months. So we want some finality on a deal. We want to allow some reasonable time uh, for a buyer to have recourse if a seller's representations were inaccurate, uh, but we don't want that to extend forever. And so we, we chose nine months because we felt like that was a fair and equal apportionment of risk between the parties. Uh, and we clearly say in here that after nine months, such representations and warranties and any cause of action relating to them uh, shall terminate. Okay, we're still on section 35, so take a look at the second sentence now because this relates to claims for representations and warranties. Uh, so what this says is that a buyer cannot make a claim for the seller breaching the seller's representations and warranties unless that claim exceeds $25,000. So again, we want finality. Uh, we want buyers to discover that claim within nine months, and if there is one there, only file it if it's material enough to exceed $25,000. Otherwise, we want finality on the transaction. There's subsection B, which says that under no circumstances shall seller be liable to buyer for breaches of representations and warranties in excess of $250,000, except uh, in the event of seller committing fraud or intentionally misrepresenting something there we don't want, we don't think it's fair to have a limit on the liability, uh, but absent those circumstances, we do think it's fair, again, for the sake of finality, the parties negotiated, accepted risks uh, to cap the seller's liability at $250,000. So you can skip ahead now to section 38, and this is a section on notices. And so we wanted to update this section, much like delivery of documents to the 21st century, uh, we now expressly allow email transmission of notices. So that's part of the reason why email addresses on page two are really important. Because now uh, delivery of notice is effective if the broker emails a copy of the document or whatever needs to be said to both the selling broker and the selling firm. We did carve out somewhat of an exception to that, which says that if the broker receiving the notice confirms back to them that they received a copy, that's sufficient in itself. There can't later be a dispute about whether notice was effective in that case. Uh, but generally, we want the practice for emailing to be that it goes to both the firm and the broker. The next important section to talk about is section 40 with assignment. Uh, so obviously, we see parties, and specifically buyers, assigning agreements all the time. And some feedback that we received is, is the frequency with which buyers are including and or assigns next to the buyer's name, uh, and then the resulting assignment of the deal from one entity to another entity that's controlled by the same as the original buyer. So we wanted to build that into this agreement, uh, into its terms to expressly allow that uh, without the parties or more specifically the brokers needing or maybe forgetting to add language into the agreement. So I'm going to read what we've added and hopefully it makes sense in that context. So first of all, this should seem familiar that the buyer cannot assign the agreement without the seller's consent, which shall not be withheld unreasonably. However, and here's the new language, buyer may assign this agreement without the consent of seller, but with notice to seller, to any entity under common control and ownership of buyer, provided that no such assignment shall relieve the buyer of its obligations hereunder. It is uh, already allowed without the broker having to make any edits or any additions for a buyer to assign this agreement to an entity under common uh, ownership and control. The buyer is still liable. The buyer is still on the hook. That language was in the old agreement as well if an assignment occurred. But now we're removing the obligation of the broker to make edits to this form in order to allow that. The words and or assigns are still described in this new agreement. 
It now says, if the words and or signs or similar words are used to identify buyer in section two, then this agreement may be assigned with notice to seller, but without need for seller's consent. And so now the legal impact is if a broker or a buyer writes and or signs next to the buyer's name, that gives them even more freedom to assign this agreement outside of just an entity under common ownership and control, uh, but really to any entity they want or any individual they want. The final change I want to highlight for you uh, is at section 42. And this is simply one sentence at the end, which says that the parties acknowledge that a signature in electronic form has the same legal effect as a handwritten signature. This is just adding some clarity to make sure that our electronic documents are valid uh, and enforceable. So that wraps up most of the substantive changes, if not all, that we made to this new form. Um, I recognize it might take some time to kind of get used to the new formatting, but again, the big takeaway is now everything you need is on page one. Much easier to use, much easier to find that information, and then hopefully with what we talked about on some of the other substantive changes, those start to make sense for you as well. Um, there might be some other smaller changes, and SEBA has resources and is available to talk about those. Uh, but again, our hope is that these changes make the documents easier for you to use, easier for your clients to understand. Uh, and with that in mind, we've made some similar changes to the addenda for the purchase and sale agreement forms. Uh, so I'll walk through those sort of one by one, and we'll talk about them. Many of them just have formatting updates or terminology updates, uh, such as feasibility, contingency date. Um, other ones have one or two substantive additions that hopefully will make sense once we talk about them. Okay, the first addenda we'll discuss are not really addenda, uh, it's the Form 17. And so there were some legislation that requires updates to this form. I say they're not addenda because they're technically not incorporated into the PSA, uh, but they do accompany purchase and sale transactions, which is why we're going to cover them now and uh, why we include them in our suite. So if we start with the Form 17C, which is the Form uh, 17 Disclosure Statement for Unimproved Property, all the changes to the Form 17C are on page 6. And so you'll see those at Section 2, Notices to the Buyer. We included some language uh, at subsection two, proximity to farming slash working forest. And you'll see working forest inserted uh, into the rest of that subsection. Again, this is in response to legislation that requires disclosure of proximity to a working forest. Subsection three uh, similarly responds to new legislation regarding oil tank insurance. So this says, this notice is, is to inform you that if the real property you are considering for purchase utilizes an oil tank for heating purposes, no cost insurance may be available from the Pollution Liability Insurance Agency. Word for word, right out of the statute. Looking at the Form 17 for improved property, you'll see the same changes that I described for the Form 17C on the final page, so that's proximity to a working forest and the disclaimer about the availability of oil tank insurance. Uh, but we also have some other changes that are worth touching on. So looking at page one, you'll see right off the bat in the header, we address common interest communities not subject to a public offering statement. That's because of the common interest community legislation that was passed. That's now a new defined term in Washington and there are new exceptions for when a seller disclosure statement is required, and that's why we've included that there. Looking at page four at section 5F, uh, we made a small change to, instead of saying smoke alarms, we now say smoke detection devices, and we added a note based on RCW 43.44.110 that uh, this notice must be provided if the property is not equipped with at least one smoke detection device. So again, that should be pretty straightforward. It's right all this out of the statute. Uh, and we just are making sure that these forms stay up to date with the legislation. And that's it for the Form 17. So just some small changes there. And now we can move on to the other agenda. Next, let's go over the changes to the SEBA Form 22E. Uh, so that is the certification under the Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act. 
So once again, this is a statutorily required form, so therefore we're updating it based on the statute. So the changes to this form are all in the box titled Buyer Certification. Uh, this instructs the uh, closing agent to withhold 15% of the amount realized from the sale and pay it to the IRS if the seller is a non-resident alien. So you'll see disclosure language there saying only fill this in if the seller is a non-resident alien. But there is a change, and that's the 15% figure. Before, this said that the closing agent must withhold 10%. There are exceptions to the closing agent withholding 15%, and that is when buyer certifies a one of the below statements on the form, and there are two statements that the buyer can certify. The first is that the amount realized from the sale is $300,000 or less, and that a member of the buyer's family has plans to reside at the property. So that's the first option. The second option is if the amount is realized as more than 300000 but does not exceed $1 million, and it will be used as a family resident, then the closing agent only needs to withhold 10% rather than the 15% I mentioned earlier. And that wraps up all the changes for this Form 22E. The next form we'll discuss is the Buyer Agency Agreement. Uh, so this is Form BB1 in the SEBA suite of forms. Um, you know, right off the bat, if you're looking at a red line version of this, you'll notice a lot of these changes are terminology. So a good example is that section one, instead of saying duration of agreement, and now says the term of agreement, there are only two changes that I think we should talk about real briefly. Uh, so the first one is in section two, definitions, and that is for the definition of firm, which now means not only buyer's broker, but also any additional firm brokers appointed by the firm to represent the buyer. We wanted to make sure that if additional brokers are appointed that they fall within uh, this agreement. The next change we should talk about is at section four where it talks about commission. We felt this was a little bit vague, so you'll see that we added language to clarify that uh, a commission is due if buyer enters into a contract to purchase. Hopefully all the rest of the changes in that form are pretty straightforward and are terminology related or make sense to you. Uh, so we'll move on to the next form. Next, take a look at SEBA form BUA. So this is the backup addendum. Most of these changes are, are formatting or are pretty small. If you look at section six, we really wanted to clarify that the buyer can terminate the backup agreement at any time prior to receiving a notice that the first sale is terminated. So in other words, until this backup buyer is accepted by the seller and there's a binding transaction, the buyer is free to walk away at any time. And we didn't want any uncertainty on that. We also wanted to remove some uncertainty in section four by clearly stating that the closing date in this addendum supersedes any conflicting closing date uh, in the PSA that accompanies this. Let's transition to the blank purchase of sale addendum form. Uh, that's form PSA. And there are no substantive changes to this form because there is no substance to this form. It's blank. Uh, but you'll see a little bit right at the front where we say the following is part of the purchase and sale agreement with reference date blank. We adjusted those words to make it clearer uh, in referencing back to the original agreement. And that's actually a change you'll see across all addenda. Uh, I thought it'd be best to point out here since there's nothing else about the form to discuss. We made some slight adjustments to the commission disbursement form. So that's form CDF. Uh, you'll see some additional underlines. You'll see buyer is now plural instead of singular. You'll see where we refer to firm instead of office. Things of that nature, but substantively the form remains the same. We made a few small changes to the earnest money promissory note. So that's form EMN. Uh, these changes, again, were only to better reference back to the purchase and sale agreement that relates to this note. Uh, so we just used the term agreement instead of saying purchase and sale agreement every single time. And then we adjusted the reference date language as well. Looking at the force majeure, 
and closing addendum, uh, which we created very recently in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We only made one small change to the opening paragraph, again, very clearly stating the reference date of the purchase and sale agreement. Next, let's take a look at the letter of intent, so the form LOI. If you're looking at a red line copy, you'll notice a little more red lines with this one, but hopefully these will make sense. In section two, with earnest money, we just revised the form of this, A, so that it's much clearer, and B, so that it resembles the new purchase and sale agreement form. So you might recall one of the changes to the purchase and sale agreement form was to allow earnest money to be paid by wire transfer. That's in there now. So we have the same check boxes in this form that are in the purchase and sale agreement. So that way, when you're taking the LOI and transferring it into a purchase and sale agreement form, they look identical. Looking at section three of the letter of intent, there's some new language uh, about extending the feasibility contingency date. So now it says, buyer may or may not, and the default is may not if unchecked, extend the expiration date of the feasibility contingency for up to blank periods of blank days, each an extension period, upon payment of an extension fee of X dollars for each extension period, which shall be non-refundable when paid, but applied towards the purchase price. We wanted to include this to give buyers a little bit more flexibility to specify right up front they want feasibility extensions and they're willing to pay a non-refundable payment for them. Also in section three, we provided check boxes for new financing or seller financing. Again, we wanted to take some of the terms from the PSA that you as brokers will have to pay attention to and put them directly in this LOI and you can simply check them if they apply or uncheck them if they don't. Section four is on title insurance. So as with the other areas of this LOI, we took the new process for reviewing the title report that's in the new PSA and we put it almost word for word into this LOI. And so that'll be clear and agreed upon in advance by the parties. The final change is to section seven on closing. So as with feasibility contingency, we added some language here that lets the buyer say right off the bat if they want the ability to extend closing for non-refundable payments. Next, if you look at the lead-based paint disclosure form, uh, that is form LPLS. Uh, we only made two small changes of this. One was to uncapitalize uh, a formally capitalized word, and the other is to include the reference date of the purchase and sale agreement. The option to buy real estate form, which is form OTB, has a few changes in it. Uh, the first section is revised to clearly state whether the option is part of a lease, uh, and if so, the property is legally described in that lease. If the option is not part of a lease, be sure to include the legal description of the property on Exhibit A. That's stated right there in Section 1. Section 2 has some language that might seem unusual to you. It says, notwithstanding the above, if buyer or seller are individuals, the expiration date shall be deemed to occur prior to the expiration of buyer or seller's life, whichever occurs later, plus 21 years. This language wasn't randomly chosen. Uh, this is chosen because this is an ancient legal principle that contracts cannot uh, just continue in perpetuity, and so this way it has a definite end. Finally, at Section 8, we adjusted the language. So before it said that no firm involved in this transaction is receiving compensation from more than one party, unless disclosed on an attached addendum. Now it says, seller and buyer consent to listing firm and or selling firm receiving compensation from more than one party. An example of where this might apply is if a uh, selling firm receives compensation directly from their client and from the seller in a transaction. Either way, this should be documented in the agreement. There are some other minor changes, but really substantively, that's it for the form at OTB. For the SEBA form promissory note, uh, we only made one change, and that was to section one, where we give the parties more options to specify when payments under the note become due. The SEBA form assignment and assumption agreement only had changes to the opening paragraph. Uh, 
Uh, once again, we more specifically referenced the reference date of the purchase and sale agreement, and we did some capitalization to the terms. Looking at the SEBA defeasance addendum, again, we only made some formatting changes. Uh, we updated the terminology so that it's consistent with the new PSA. So we use the term feasibility contingency date instead of feasibility period. And we directly cite the reference date of the agreement. The SEBA financing addendum has three or four changes that we should just briefly touch on. The first one is in section one, where it now clearly states if the buyer is getting new financing, the buyer waives the financing contingency if the buyer fails to complete the written application for the financing. Next in section two, again, we're revising feasibility period to say feasibility contingency date because that's the terminology used in the new purchase and sale agreement. And then finally, it's section 3B, this addresses seller financing. We took the structure of the new promissory note, one of the payment terms in subsection B to directly mirror the payment terms in the promissory note. Again, that way it makes it easier to transfer information from the financing addendum into the seller financing documents at closing. The tenant estoppel certificate only has one change and it's the section nine. Uh, keep in mind that the purpose of the certificate is for tenants to fill out for potential buyers, maybe a lender, and they're essentially certifying all the terms of the lease as they go through the certificate. The change in Section 9 doesn't substantively impact this form. All the Section 9 is really doing is moving the second sentence to the end, and it's confirming that any personal guarantee remains in full force and effect. We made a couple of changes to the rescission of purchase and sale agreement, and that was really just to provide clarity at the end of a transaction. Uh, so section one now clearly releases all brokers from liability, and section two allows the brokers to fill in for the closing agent where the earnest money should be distributed. We revised the recorder's cover sheet to add some check boxes. And so if you look at the sheet, it now says in the middle there's a checkbox next to additional reference numbers on page X of the document. So you would check this uh, if there are reference numbers that you can't fit on the cover sheet and you need to include them on additional pages. Uh, similarly, if there are additional names of the grantors, there's now a checkbox to include, the, include those on another page. And same for the grantees, same for additional legal descriptions. Again, our intention is just to make this clear. Without the checkboxes, it stated that additional parties were on other pages when that might not be the case. So now we know if the checkbox isn't checked, there are not additional pages that need to be referenced. The utility charges addendum is really straightforward. We added the opportunity to put an email address in. We added the reference state of the agreement. And we added the option to put a website in as well. That's it. We needed to update the vacant land addendum to cite the correct sections of the purchase and sale agreement because those sections have now changed. So you'll see that the feasibility contingency is now at paragraph 23 of the purchase and sale agreement, whereas it used to be uh, at paragraph 5. So we did that change. And then we also uh, specifically called out the reference date of the purchase and sale agreement. We expanded the short sale addendum just to make it a little clearer for the parties. Looking at section one, it says in the second sentence, therefore this agreement is contingent upon written consent from seller's creditors, and here's the new language, having a security interest in the property to sell. We added that language to clarify that creditors having a security interest in the property need to consent to the sale. Continuing on there, that we added language to specifically say that the seller must accept any conditions that are then imposed by those creditors. And seller shall have X days after mutual acceptance to obtain that lender's consent 
and if the seller accepts any conditions imposed by those creditors, deliver the consent to the buyer. So we just expanded that section to be a little bit clearer to sort of walk through both the consent of the creditors and the seller's acceptance of any new conditions that may be imposed by those creditors. Section 2 includes a right to terminate the agreement by the seller. Uh, this existed before, but it was a little more vague. Uh, it said that the seller basically had three days to terminate the agreement if seller's creditors did not agree or the seller did not accept the terms of the creditor. Now we just say very straightforward, seller may terminate the agreement at any time until the lender's uh, consent. Finally, we added a new section five, uh, which is just a disclaimer really to benefit the brokers and to advise the clients. It says, the parties acknowledge this addendum does not address or explain many aspects of a short sale. The parties also acknowledge having been advised to seek the advice of an attorney and other experts before entering into the agreement. Short sales are complicated, so we recommend that you advise your clients, consult with an attorney, and we include this language just to ensure that gets done. We can talk about the exclusive sale listing agreement and the exclusive agency sale listing agreement together because the changes to those forms were basically identical. You'll see some changes to terminology, like at section one, we say term of agreement instead of duration of agreement. Uh, but the main change to pay attention to is in Section 5. At the end of Section 5, it used to reference the property information page of the agreement. Instead, we included language right in the middle of Section 5 that says that the seller is warranting that all information the seller is providing to you in connection with the listing is true and correct. All the other changes in the forms should be pretty straightforward and should make sense. This is really the only substantive change in the forms to call out. So that wraps up our changes to the purchase and sale agreement form and addenda. I know it's a lot of information to digest, but thanks for working through it with me today. We're really excited to roll these forms out. Hopefully they're easier to use and most importantly, help you be successful in your business.